in the short term, how are we going to staff these accountable care organizations? How are we going to manage when we have a world where most physicians, the vast majority of physicians, are specialists and the primary care pool is relatively small? I'm worried about both sides. We can find ways to support primary care physicians through nurse practitioners, through PAs, through other ways that could help a little. I'm as much concerned as an economist about what are all these specialists going to be doing, uh, not quietly fading into the sunset for sure. And how do we get ourselves through the period of trying to right balance who is out there? I mean, we have all kinds of incentives in terms of uh, loan forgiveness, uh, targeting, changing reimbursement to try to uh, shift the, uh, the mix. Uh, but you know that is not a short-term solution. Let me add on a nuance to that, which I know is probably in the minds of many of the viewers, which is what happens with academic medical centers in this environment where there's a lot of great special expertise, which I think the marketplace wants. Most specialists are still working in the same fee-for-service environment that requires them to spend all of their time, you know, or at least a conscious amount of their time generating revenue. And if you look at some of integrated delivery systems, much of specialist time, whether it's at Kaiser or Group Health, it starts to be devoted to thinking about quality improvement and thinking about the health of the population they're serving. If we're starting to reorient the organizations toward improving the health of the population and improving care, specialist knowledge is absolutely critical. Um, but it may con specialists may contribute both through their practice and through their contribution to improving the systems of care. In terms of academic medical centers, I think there is a real challenge here. And I think it's a, there's some positive sides, that is academic medicine should be leading the development of new models of care that can successfully meet the challenges we face. It's not been their traditional, most academic medical centers traditional focus of activity, the development of new models of care, but it certainly could be. And I think we will have to think carefully about how do we continue to support the, the real advances in science um, that, are, that we need to get from our academic medical centers. A lot of the costs of innovation at academic medical centers are sort of built into the, hidden in the price structures of the way we pay for healthcare now. If we move to purely value-based payment, where uh, an academic medical center has to sort of compete with the community hospital next door, um, it would be very hard for the academic medical centers to continue as innovators. So I think one of the policy challenges we all face is to figure out how to make sure that academic that the costs of academic medicine are somehow kept separate. One of the attractions of ACOs to me is that rather than have the government set workforce policy and say, well, we will have X percent primary care physicians, in effect, uh, if, if accountable care organizations became prevalent, accountable care organizations would would be determining, as Scale said, what's the mix of specialists, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants that we want. And then that would drive really, uh, uh, to some extent would drive physician incomes uh, and all, uh, relative to each other, uh, and also drive the number of people that would be trained in primary care. But in the short term, there could be some dislocations. Just one other comment about that, I, I would say that I actually think that, I actually think that probably a good 50 or 60% if not more, uh, visits to primary care physicians, face-to-face -face visits don't need to be face-to-face. -face. I think in terms of specialists, um, I, I think there will be grenade lobbying. Uh, and so I, I'd be interested in, in, in hearing what, what you two well, think. Well, let's, ahead, pre Tom. let's pretend yeah. for a moment yeah. that we are a highly paid consulting group and, we're gonna, and we're, we've got two engagements, one with an academic medical center and one with Larry's old practice, small practice. You know, what advice would we give them? Uh, you know, do we plunge in in 2012, try to take advantage of whatever opportunities CMS and the Innov Innovation Center create, uh, try to be first in? Uh, first in is usually highly risky. Uh, first in uh, has a strong correlation with losing money. Second and third in is a terrific place. So my advice would be you may or may not want to be first in. It depends how clear the rules are and how quickly they come out, and then when you know what you're facing, how quickly you can respond. So advice to any provider, you know, hospital, academic medical center, or primary care practice, 
I think the days of unrestricted fee-for-service medicine where you can raise your prices you know, as much as you want are gone. You know, it may take a little while for them to really go away. In the new world, that we'll have, there will be some relationship between value and payment. Even now, you can begin to prepare by reducing unit costs. You win under fee-for-service if you're thoughtful about how to take costs out of your current processes, and you win, certainly win under, mm -hmm. under more global payment models, whether they're episode-based payment um, or, or, cap or, or full capitation, as some integrated systems are, are already receiving. So I think you know, that's certainly you know, being prepared for a shift to value-based payment, to learn the skills of how do you manage cost within a system rather than ignore them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How do you think then about the next step, which is population management, which you know, Larry was talking about, where you're actually able, if you're a primary care practice, to think about how can we manage the care of a population of primary care patients with diabetes or heart failure. And mm -hmm. there are payment models out there now, the, you know, the patient-centered medical home model, which is really pretty closely aligned with the ACO, and, mm -hmm. and many are seeing them as, as partners. Um, with an ACO f leading to a strengthening of, patient, of the patient-centered medical home, you know, they're all about you know, trying to apply just the processes that Larry was mm -hmm. describing of effective care management processes, and you can win under a, a PCMH model, you mm -hmm. know, primary care patient-centered medical home model in the short term. And actually kind of the holy grail at the end of all this would, would be uh, where an ACO is large enough and competent enough so payers would basically say, here's the money, you take care of patients, you do it the best way that you know how. There's no utilization management, there's no prior authorization, there's no denying of fee-for-service claims. You just do it the best you can and we'll be measuring quality and, and, and patient experience to make sure you're not stinting on care. I think that the calculation is right now, how does the cost of running this ICO, creating it and running it, if you add that to revenue, net revenue that you would lose by not supplying cer certain services, you have to compare that to any revenue that might come into you for providing better care. I, and one thing that could make it worthwhile and also would be, I think, desirable from a values point of view is to have income come not only from shared savings, so not only if you save money for Medicare or a health plan do you get some money, but also for quality bonuses. Uh, do you think doctors have to be employed to make this model work well? Well, well Gail referred earlier to the idea of more virtual organizations at, at the beginning of our discussion. Certainly the various articles that have come out about ACOs and the legislation all say, well, it could be an IPA, it could be a physician hospital organization. So there could be these virtual networks where, and the concept is physicians who want to be in small practices and patients who like to go see physicians in small practices. And there are real distinct advantages, I believe, to that setting for both patients and physicians would have the option to remain so. And the um, all the uh, infrastructure support, which would be so necessary to make a high-function ACO, would come from uh, the IPA or the PHO or whatever network there is to um, provide support. Uh, I think that, I mean, that's a very attractive concept to me. So I would like to see these virtual org network organizations succeed. As, as Gail said, I think it will be very, very difficult for them to succeed. I think that uh, the incentives would have to be much stronger than they are now. It's not that easy to, to create these things, but I hope that um, things will be structured in such a way that there's the, at least a po possibility mm -hmm. to create them. And I think no ACO will work without strong mm -hmm. leadership, without a strong culture, uh, and without a, a strong organized processes that mm -hmm. are right in the DNA of the organization. And by definition, none of those things can be created overnight. So I think whether it's employed physicians, and even more so if it's not employed physicians, it's going to be a, even with the, and, and even if the incentive is right, it's going to be a hard slog to, to, to make these things work. Now, Gail, you know, you're on the board of United, and you and I are both on the board of Geisinger. Uh, if providers can't get organized, do the health plans fill the gap? Do, do they effectively become the accountable care organizations? Is, is that what, how are they looking at the future? Uh, I think that um, uh, it is possible that uh, one of the models that could uh, be tried would be physician groups working with payers. Um, I, you know, as I've indicated, I'm very eager to have physicians step up, uh, however, but be take a, a bigger leadership uh, role. And yes, of course, it could be the health plans uh, as well. Uh, they have a lot of organizational structure. Uh, they've got the data to help differentiate uh, and do a lot of the performance systems and the information systems. Again, it hasn't been in their financial interest 
uh, when they tried in the 1990s, uh, not very adroitly, uh, but they did actually push down spending very significantly. Uh, there was huge pushback by the Congress and by uh, the American population, in part because individuals weren't choosing the health plans that they wanted to be in. So, you know, we're going to really have to decide how serious we are about uh, trying to slow down spending and, um, uh, and improve quality. Uh, it may be like Massachusetts, uh, that uh, if we are really successful in extending coverage uh, to the vast majority of the population, uh, we are absolutely going to have to do something uh, to slow down spending and, oh, by the way, try to get better clinical outcomes. The system we've got just is incapable of producing that outcome.